Okay, here we go. So now we're going to try to learn how to do a forecast using single exponential smoothing. And what this technique is, it's very similar to a moving average, but it kind of self-corrects for the error term. Um, it keeps us from overcorrecting when demand changes just a little bit or the other, or it uh, also keeps us from uh, staying too straight if demand is changing. So we're going to do uh, smooth uh, exponential smoothing using a smoothing constant of 0.3 and one of 0.2 using this very large data file for propane imports, uh, prices for propane imports, which is very similar to the natural gas imports that I gave you all to do. So we're going to start off, you notice on the fourth line here, and what, well, first I'll tell you what, you know, actually smoothing constant does. A smoothing constant of 0.3, you'll also hear that called an alpha. And Excel calls it a dampening factor. Well, that's exactly what it is. It dampens uh, the effect that your past forecast has on uh, your prior averages. So a smoothing constant of 0.3 using single exponential smoothing, which is a very easy way to do it, you're taking 30% of the prior forecasted amount and adding 70% of the prior actual amount. So it keeps you true to your moving average, but if it's, as it changes, it kind of changes with it. So if you are over a little bit, it kind of, it, it will show a, a, you know, a, a negative error term, it will kind of decrease it a little bit, you know, the next time. So what we do, you notice we start here on the fourth line. Well, I do that just to give us a starting point. So if you'll notice, um, this cell in D4 is a three period moving average for the prior three terms. Do you have to do that? No, especially not with a data set this large. It's gonna, you could use just the prior week's actual, which is what Excel does, and it's gonna correct itself all the way down. I chose this just to kind of show you that you do it either way. Um, so let's go ahead and enter the first term for the uh, exponential smoothing. Now, we could just enter 0.3 times the prior forecast plus 0.7 times the prior actual, but I'm going to do it as a formula. That way everything is linked on the whole, in, on the entire forecast so I can use an optimizer to correct later. So the way we do that, go ahead and open parentheses so it's going to be equals. For 70 rather than 0.70, we're going to put 1 minus. this smoothing constant. And that's exactly why I have it in its own cell. So we can do that. Times shift F8 prior week actual. So B10. We're going to add to that 30% of the forecasted amount for the prior term. So uh, we actually don't need Parentheses there, it's just going to be our smoothing constant again, D5. Shift F8 gives us a little asterisk to multiply. Prior week's forecast, D10. Now, if you leave it this way, it's going to give you the, the correct answer here, but as you drag that formula down, it's going to drag the smoothing constant cell down with it so you get an error term by the second cell. So we resolve that by using our little dollar signs. Uh, I just choose to use Shift F4 and let it do mine for me. So go ahead and highlight both D5s. 
put your dollar signs in front. That that tells Excel to leave that cell static. So no matter where you drag the formula, it's referring to that, that cell. So we'll hit enter. And there we go. So now what we need, an error term. The actual for this period minus the forecasted amount. And we see it's negative, so we actually plan for more. Absolute error term is simply absolute value, ABS, of the previous cell. Squared error amount, you can use either one of these because both going to come out positive when you square it. So, I'll just use that one. Now, you could either put an asterisk and multiply it by itself, or to do an exponent in Excel, Shift 6 brings up a little hat. That tells Excel to raise it to the second power. So that's how you do exponents in Excel. And now we need absolute percent error, so absolute value of our error term relative to the actual price or demand, whatever you're looking for. So now, as you can see, I already have my numbers formatted. Let's just drag the whole bar. And you see it drags everything down all nice formatted nicely and we can go back up and do the same thing for the other one. So here we're doing the same thing. Notice we still got the prior three months average as a starting point. Except for now with a point two, we're using 80% of the forecast and 80% of the actual rather and 20% of the forecast. So equal, then we're gonna do the same thing here. One minus, smooth and constant times, prior week actual, plus smooth and constant or alpha times, prior week forecast. And for that smooth and constant, go ahead and add our dollar signs there. It's an absolute formula. Again, uh oh, control Z will fix that. Function F4 will add it for you. So hit enter, and there we go. So now, actual. Minus planned, absolute value of that, ABS, should just have the positive value, equals L11 to the second power, so squared error, equals Absolute deviation relative to the actual. So, same thing. Highlight, look for the little green dot. And drag it down. Okay, so there we go. Now, we have to do something with these numbers to get our answers, if you had figured that out. So, rather than scrolling and capturing all of these long columns as an array, or having to remember which row we were on, I prefer to freeze the pane. So, we're starting on row 11. So, let's drop down to row 12. 
immediately to the right of the values we need to compare. So immediately to the right of the price, so it's going to be C12. Go ahead and highlight that cell, click View, Freeze Panes, and Freeze the Pain. You should see some little crosshairs here, and you do. And everything above the column you had highlighted, and everything to the left of that column will be there. So it allows you to compare. Especially useful with large data sets such as this. So now we need a tracking signal to measure a bias, mean absolute deviation, mean squared error, and mean absolute percent error. Uh, these are just terms we use to kind of be able to compare how large our error is or, or how good our forecast is. So a tracking signal that is a measure of bias. So if it's very large positive, then that means our actual, especially if we're, if we're trying to forecast demand, is always larger than our planned, which means we never have enough on hand. Uh, so that could run into stockouts. That could be, you know, pretty tough, pretty quick. Conversely, if it's always negative, then we're always carrying too much and we're wasting, you know, a lot of money keeping stuff on hand. So as we add the actual errors, we're hoping that the positive and negatives cancel each other out to some degree. And, you know, you're always going to have some deviations, um, even the smoothest demand. I mean, think about potato chips, Coca-Cola. Uh, you always go to the grocery store on Friday. They count on you every Friday. Uh, maybe their weekly order runs from Monday to Monday. Well, you didn't make it this time till Tuesday, but you bought twice as much. Well, if they didn't order as much when they didn't see you Friday because they thought they'd lost you, now they run out. So uh, this is just kind of a self-correcting. So we take the sum. So I'm just going to go ahead and label what we need. And the mean absolute deviation, or MAD, that adds all the positives. So we get the total distance away from the forecast. So it keeps the positives and negatives from canceling each other out. Then we take the mean of that to get a, you know, each period, each forecast period, in this case, each two week period, it shows uh, relative what we can expect, and, you know, an average amount that we are away from the forecast, either plus or minus, we just need to know. So if you take the sum of all the errors and divide it by the mean absolute deviation, it's going to give you how much bias you have, either positive or negative, in your forecast. So you can kind of control for it or, or at least know how much safety stock to keep on the count of it. Mean squared error, that's just, um, we're not gonna use it now, but your book talks about it, so this is how you do it. You just square that error, error term or even the absolute deviation, makes everything bigger, so it's easier to get a standardized number for. So, I'm uh, just gonna drag these on over. And obviously, you've already seen mean absolute percent error. Just shows this squared error term relative to the size of your actual number that you're forecasting. So uh, gives you a way to compare, look at it. See, here we have a 36, so that one's pretty jacked up right there. The rest of them are fairly low. So you can kind of compare apples. Oh, it is basically the same thing on the other side. And I do this, you don't have to, you don't have to put the answers at the top or the bottom, you need them somewhere. But I like to put, do my calculations down here, where my numbers are, and then transfer them up top so I don't have to scroll through 494 rows just to find what I'm looking for. So it's tracking, as well, let's go ahead and calculate our sum equals sum. And by having where we started, we'll be 11. 
colon E492 should capture this entire row loop column as an array. And you don't have to drag and take all that. So we see uh, sum of the error term 1.9 for a column this large. That's actually pretty good. Get the mean, average. And we call them F, so F11, F492. Close it, hit enter, and there we go. I'll just go ahead and drag those over since they're both averages. Format that. Little zeros out twice. And 1.94, which is pretty good. Um, now I just got kind of, to get our tracking signal equals sum over the mean absolute deviation, 56. And again, for something that's nearly 500 rows long, you expect it to be off some, so we're not necessarily looking to hold it between plus and minus four for something that's large, it's actually pretty good. Um, here we've already calculated all these, so equals, equals that, equals that, and there we go. Now we do the same thing over here equals sum, and call it K11, colon, K492, close it, and there we go. Go ahead and drag it over one to save time. Then I'm just going to replace the word sum with average. And there's our mean. So now we're going to drag that exact cell over twice and format this one. And there we go. So our tracking signal here is again sum of the error terms of the mean absolute value of the error terms 54. And these we've already calculated. One point seven six. So, according to this, and since this is a very commoditized product, which is going to be extremely steady, uh, it's looking more like just a standard moving average is going to be better. Well, let's see. This is why we wrote the formula in. We'll use the optimizer in Excel to find the optimum tracking number for this data set. So let's make sure we have it turned on. Click File, to top Excel, and then go to Options, and it should open up a little window. I hope we can see it. Uh, it may be blocked out because Zoom thinks you need to be looking only at the Excel file. But if you can't, scroll down the left side and you should say something called Add-ins. Click on it. At the top of that, it'll say active application add-ins. It'll tell you which ones you already have active. I already have analysis tool pack and solver. If you don't, a lot of times there's a drop down menu at the bottom, it says manage and then there's drop down. Uh, usually default, it says com add-ins. Scroll down and click on Excel and then click go. It's gonna pull every Excel add-in that you have loaded. Um, click on analysis tool pack and solver add-in. We will use those in this course, the rest of the course. Analysis tool pack VBA, that's for macros and programming. You're welcome to click on there, but if you don't use it, it will just slow down your Excel. So I only click the ones I need. Uh, Euro currency tools, uh, I only spend dollar bills, so I don't click that unless I'm in Europe. So solver and analysis pack, click OK, they should be on. 
Now, how do we find them? How do we use them? Okay. If you could talk to the Let's analyze data analysis and solver. We're going to click on solver this time. That's actually an optimizer. It should say solve. Coming up for y'all. Set objective. So it's going to tell you what we're trying to change. Our overall goal here. I'm going to click on H5 and Excel automatically puts your little dollar bill signs in there. We're going to try to minimize mean absolute percent error. You could also minimize the mean squared error. It's going to give you the same thing because they both work off of each other. Now, right below it, be sure to click minimize because if you leave it on max, it's going to give you um, that stuff in from last time I'll just leave it out I'm going to give you the maximum error that we could come up with within the range of a tracking signal or of a smoothing compromise so we're going to minimize mean absolute percent error by changing our smoothing constant and it has to be a hard value that you put in to be able to change and this objective has to be linked for this to work. That's why we typed in the formula. So every time the computer changes this moving constant just a little bit and it'll put in 0.31 point, you know, however many decimals, and it does it a lot faster than you and I could ever do. It's gonna change all these numbers in the background. But first we have to set the parameters. So we'll go down to subject to the constraints, click add. So, our smoothing conf constant needs to be between zero and one by definition. So, it's already set for less than or equal to, so we'll go ahead and put a one and click OK. And there it is. We need to add the zero, so click the smoothing constant. Second cell, drop it down and click greater than or equal to. We'll put zero. And there we go. GRG nonlinear. And we'll click solve and see what it does. Okay. Solver has found a local optimal solution, so zero. Obviously, if we're 100% past forecast, then it's telling me that a moving average naive forecast would work better here. Well, considering this is a very commoditized product with very stable demand, a moving average is probably great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click turn restore original values and just see what it would give me if we make it use something so again click that uh, click solver let's change this constraint and you don't have to do this this is just something I'm doing to show you to point one, we'll make it use something. Click OK. Now solve. And it settled on point one. So whatever you, it's going to minimize it. You see that percent error is a little bit higher. The bias goes down a little bit. So yeah, here moving average will work better, but your optimal value for this particular data set is 0.1. Okay, we'll show you really quickly that Excel will do this for you. So if you come over here, I've already got you know another data set already put up. You can see my X's are out of line with each other. That's because Excel will do it for you, but you have to start two rows above or you want to. One, Excel has to figure out that it doesn't have enough data 
to create your know, forecast and you'll get not available. So the next line, it will create it for you by using a naive forecast, which will just be the previous week's actual. Then the third, it will actually use whatever smoothing constant you put in to create your forecasted terms. And I'll show you. So go ahead and click on D9 here, then go back into data, data analysis, and click on exponential smoothing. Okay. I already have it captured, so since we're starting Hopefully we're back here. So again, starting at D9 using the actual values from B9 to B492, our dampening factor here, 0.3, because we had a 0.3 smoothing constant. Now we have to select an output range. Uh, go ahead and select D9. Uh, now I want to click OK, no labels. We're not going to chart anything or put the errors, so leave those unclicked. I'll click OK, it's going to know that that little X is in there, and it's, so it's going to tell me, do you, you know, you already got something in there. OK, I'm going to overwrite it, and there we go. So like I said, first time it says, nope, we don't have enough to create a forecast off of. Second time, as you see, we get a naive forecast, which is just the previous term. Then from here down, as you can see up top, 0.7 times 0.10 plus 0.3 times D10. So we won't be able to optimize anything using Excel's formula, but it will do the work for us. So here, actual minus and forecasted equals absolute value of yeah, help if I use the right one uh, the error term here should be just a positive value of our error it is equals squared deviation so either one of those little hat two then absolute deviation over relative to the actual value. And there we go. So we can grab this, grab our little green dot and drag it all the way down and see what we get. Hopefully I left all these formulas in so we can just look at it. And I did, so 1.95, we had a 1.94 over there, so pretty close, huh? And let's come back up, our tracking error. And we'll fix that later on. We can do the same thing here, so we'll just clear this out. Go to data, data analysis, exponential smoothing, and their data values are already, they're still in there. So B9 to B492, change our smoothing comp constant to two, our dampening factor. And clear this out, let's tell Excel. Okay. And there we go. So, we have new course. Minus. Equals absolute value of our forecasted error. Equals squared value of our error term. Uh, equals deviation over actual 
value. So now we can capture all this and drag it. And there we go, 1.76, which I think is what we had in the prior one. So pretty close. So it doesn't matter where you start here, really. It's going to correct itself all the way back. So let's see here. Yeah, we can go ahead, just grab somewhere down and up over there and click freeze pane so I can figure why before I left out of that formula. Our tracking signal equals this over this should be somewhere around 56 and yep, that equals that. And that equals that. So pretty close. Everything else is right there. Well, there we go. And that's how you do exponential 